The Thurber Prize for American Humor is the nation's highest recognition of humor writing. The wit, James Thurber wrote, makes fun of other persons. The satirist makes fun of the world. The humorist makes fun of himself, but in doing so, he or she identifies himself with people, that is, people everywhere, not for the purpose of taking them apart, but simply revealing their true nature. The finalists here tonight help me make sense of the world with all due respect to the vital role of each Kardashian. <laughs> but the people who find the funny in the pain, like our finalists tonight, are all the more valuable to us at all times, but especially now, when the world daily seems to make less and less sense, seems crueler, meaner. By smell alone, Mike Birbiglia is a man who appreciates a good story. From his deep roots in improv and storytelling, he continues to yes and his career to new and award-winning heights across the page, television, film, radio, stand-up stage, and even the bright lights of Broadway. <laughs> so, so the book, uh, if you haven't read the book, the book is, uh, is about how all, of, about all the reasons of why I never wanted to have a child and, uh, in detail, and then how I had a child, and how I was right. And, uh, uh, but then, ultimately, spoiler alert, how I, how I was wrong. And um, so one of the reasons, um, uh, that I never want to have a child is, is called I Love My Marriage. I feel lucky to have found my wife. I never thought I'd meet someone who'd put up with me. I thought I'd find someone who'd pretend to be okay with me and try to change me, fail, and then divorce me, but that didn't happen. Jen loves me back. One time she was rubbing my neck and I said, do I feel more tense than usual? And she said, you've been 80 to 100% tense since the day we met. <laughs> and I thought, she really gets me. The, uh, when Jen and I first met, our work schedules didn't match. She worked nine to six in an office building overlooking the Hudson, and I was on the road 70% of the time doing shows. To make matters worse, when I was in New York City, I was performing at night, so I, stay with me, showed up at her job every day without an invitation for two and a half weeks. In current times, this would be called stalking. <laughs> at the time, it was called stalking. So I'd show up at Jen's work uh, with flowers and I'd pop into the conference room or her office and Jen would be mortified. She'd whisk me outside to Pier 60 overlooking the Hudson and we'd make out on the pier. The first time this happened, Jen dropped her phone uh, in the river mid-kiss. Uh, this is a poem that she wrote which is a prank called Prank Calls from Fish. The first time my husband kissed me, my cell phone fell out of my pocket into the Hudson River, and to this day, I still receive prank calls from fish. <laughs> Jen is a poet. She's always published under a pseudonym. It's Allen Ginsberg. And, no, it's, it's J. Hope Stein, but I've coaxed Jen into revealing her pseudonym for this book, which means she plans to switch to a new, even more secrety pseudonym upon its publication. Uh, Jen is very private until now. She's never shared her pseudonym with family or friends, which I find maddening. So I created a pseudonym of my own, who is an online superfan of her pseudonym, who writes love letters to her pseudonym, and his name is Ember Bones. <laughs> and I write emails uh, from Ember Bones to her account. And at one point, I sent flowers from Ember Bones and a follow-up email that read, did you get the flowers? Was that okay with your husband? I googled him, he's a comedian. I've never heard of him. <laughs> Jen replied, Mr. Bones, yes, I did get your flowers, beautiful. My cat Mazzy especially loves them since they remind her when she was a street cat. <laughs> My husband is very secure in our relationship. Sincerely, J. Hope Stein. Um, one night Jen came home from a poetry reading and I asked how it went and she said there was no microphone because and because my voice is so quiet, no one could hear me. So for our first anniversary, I bought her a microphone and an amplifier to bring to her readings. And on the, on the box, I placed a card that read, Dear Chloe, her name's Jen, your voice needs to be heard. I'm obsessed with Jen's voice. I'm one of the few people who gets to hear it. She's an introvert, and I'm an extrovert. An extrovert is someone 
who gets energy from being around other people and an introvert doesn't like you. <laughs> or she might like you, but she's gonna need her husband to explain why we're leaving the party. When James McBride is not winning awards for music, he is the best-selling and award-winning author of numerous books, covering both fiction and nonfiction. From his memoir, The Color of Water, to wartime drama, The Miracle of St. Anna, McBride has stunned audiences with his ability to dig into the heaviest of topics and wring them for their other truths. You like me, you really like me. <laughs> um, thank you very much, so, so nice to see so many white people, I mean nice people here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't really, uh, it's really hard to follow. Uh, you know, when an Irishman starts telling jokes, you're dead. <laughs> so um, I don't really have much to offer in the way of uh, prepared information. Um, when, I, uh, when I wrote this book, uh, Deacon King Kong, a lot of it came from my experience um, growing up in church. Uh, anyone who was here is from Brooklyn. Um, if you go by uh, 609 Clinton Street, Red Hook, uh, any weekend, any Saturday especially, uh, you'll see me there, uh, a little tiny church that my parents started when I was, before I was born actually. And the uh, church is still there, still in the same housing projects where I was born. I run a little music program there for the kids from the projects. And a couple of them uh, going applying the college, got into college this year and they got scholarships. It's been, been very um, fulfilling. And we're not asking for money, by the way, just, just so you know. <laughs> um, but in any case, um, one of the things that's interesting about black American life is that, you know, when you go to the movies and you see a depiction of black churches, especially, or black people, you know, you always see some like, you know, if you see a movie, and there's a black moment where something happens to you. Somebody's going, oh, geez, oh, oh. You know, I say, somebody, will somebody give her some lyrics? It's just like some hollering, oh, Lord. I mean, so I've always felt like the, the depiction of black life in the church is very stereotypical because when you, you walk by, you say, what's going on in there? And so Deacon King Kong is about what goes on in there. Now, I grew up in the church, and um, I'm a saxophonist by train, went to Oberlin right up the road, and um, <laughs> any Oberlin people here? No Oberlin people? Uh, don't look at me, oh, don't even know. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I, I learned to play piano in church because my family was, was uh, you know, we were all in church and we went to church a lot. So my sister Helen was uh, the church pianist. And when, when she was 15, Helen quit, and she just wouldn't play anymore. That was it. And my sister Judy became the church um, pianist, and she was pretty good, and she's, she still plays. She's a music teacher. And then when, uh, when uh, Judy wasn't available, I'd be called into, into service, which was always a problem, because when someone gets the spirit, you know, and this, you, you know, they're playing, and they start singing in F sharp, you know, you go, like, come back to F sharp. And they just, they just sing the whole song in the second verse and nobody remembers the words to, and they just plow right ahead. And at the end, you know, it's just, ah, amen, you know. <laughs> so it was always a problem for me because, you know, when the minister talks, the minister back then, he liked a little music behind, so you'd play, you know. And he, we need a new van, and it was, you know, pass the tray, you know. <laughs> You haven't given anything, you know? And so, and then when he preached, he liked, he liked some, he liked a little groove behind him too. And I, I never knew, because he'd start like a choo-choo, and he'd say like, ch, ch, ch. And so, you know, you'd be. And then he, ah, oh, Jesus, God, and I didn't know, whoop. Because he would nod at you when you were supposed to stop, and I didn't know. <laughs> so that was a problem too. And the other thing was that when you played, you know, when you like, when you know, if you play like a water from we have in Jesus, you know.
and I, got in, I had gotten into jazz, you know, and my brother Richie, he, we would listen to jazz. So when it was, you know, he'd be, the minister would be talking, I'd be like. <laughs> and my mother would be in the back of the church like this, I'm gonna kill you, kill you. Oh. And we'd do stuff like uh, Pass Me Not, like, uh, Pass Me Not, and we'd do, Fart me not, my mama. <laughs> but the stereotypical image of, of black people, particularly black women in the church, I've always found um, wrong because the dynamics of African American life means that black women in church are so sophisticated about things. They know exactly what to say, they know exactly when not to say it. They've suffered so much, they laugh all the time. And no matter what you do, they still, still love you. And uh, so when I see these films and media depictions of black women, it's like, you better go. And I say to myself, well, it's not even funny to me. But there are lots of things in church that are funny. And so Deacon King Kong is a book that really just captures part of, of that church life. And essentially, this book is about a church in Brooklyn and about an old man who part of the church, and they call him Deacon King Kong because he likes to sip the joy juice. <laughs> and uh, is it based on a real character? It's based on many real characters that I knew in church and loved, and same kind of guys who would, you know, after the service, they'd pull out a pocket full of change and fish through all the quarters and hand you a nickel. <laughs> and no one does sharp, topical, humor better than Alexandra Petri. Since becoming the youngest ever columnist for the Washington Post, Petri's digital column, Compost, <laughs> has delighted readers with satirical takes on the issues of the day and on at least one occasion, mistakenly presented in a Trump White House daily press briefing as real news. <laughs> Hello! It is so wonderful to be here. Oh my God. Mike Probiglia, James McBride, John Kenny. Phenomenal! Oh my goodness. The, I, the last time I left the house for an extended period of time was to give birth. So no matter what happens tonight, this has already been way better. <laughs> I have a two month old now who is alive, I, I think. Uh, She's with her dad. We have an app that you update every time she poops, so I can check the app and see, like, if she's pooping. She's probably, that's a sign of life um, from a distance. But, no, if you want to know what giving birth is like, uh, I took some notes while it was happening <laughs> on my phone, because I'm a millennial. And uh, I said it was like having a metal pole inserted into your midsection, like having a harpoon pulled out of you via your back like a back pain that you think, well, maybe there's another position that'll be comfortable, but then you realize that the pain is wherever you are. <laughs> like surgery, if someone's doing surgery on you without anesthesia, mostly by just pulling at your skin, a bad pain, <laughs> that was an eloquent note, uh, <laughs> like the back snapping, or a big rubber tire being torn in half, like a hammer, I think, or some sort of mechanical piece of equipment whose function is to pound, or sort of like a big oyster being pried open by claws under the sea. Not so good. <laughs> Not a big fan of this contraction. Definitely getting closer. Like having your blubber pulled off of you, you are a whale. Uh, <laughs> like in big strips. Like an ice cream scoop to the body. Like being hole punched and you're the paper and the hole puncher is one of those big black metal ones that really exerts force. <laughs> like when you die in a dream. <laughs> like you're having the stuffing ripped out of you. Feels like meat being picked off a bone. Weakness and possibly also the soul leaving the body. <laughs> like being unrolled when your whole existence depends on being rolled like a cigarette or something like that. 
Like being a french fry the moment a seagull picks it up in its beak. <laughs> like when a rolled up carpet is bent in half and whacked against something and you are the carpet. Like slamming a door on your thumb, but your entire body is the thumb. <laughs> like one long tooth is extending to impale you. Like one of those metal tongs you use for pressing a fancy sandwich is clamping down around your entire midsection. A panini press, that's the thing. Like you're being pulled into orbit via your intestines. Like there's a dense gravitational black hole inside you. Okay, I think it's time for the epidural. So that's what I thought childbirth was like, in case, you know, for any future reference. My mom got really mad that I published it. She was like, the world doesn't need to know. Uh, but what I'm here to read, though, is from this book, uh, <laughs> which I wrote earlier. Uh, and it's called, Excuse Me, Director, I Have Some Questions About My Role in the Spring Play as a Crisis Actor because we live in a broken country, and so after the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shootings, many students spoke out in favor of gun control, and certain parts of the internet accused them of being crisis actors hired for the occasion, which naturally, crisis actors would require crisis casting. So, dear Mr. Spencer, first, I am so excited to be cast in the spring production this year as a crisis actor, and I look forward to giving the role my all. Since I have previously starred as Courtney, Legally Blonde, Chorus, Grease, and Factory Worker 3, third alternate for Madame Thenardier, Les Mis, among other roles, you know you can expect 100% from me, even though I'm only a sophomore. As an actor, this gives me what I've always craved the most, total anonymity, no attention whatsoever, and a guarantee that no one will ever learn my name. My mom is always like, why do I have to drive you to the theater three nights a week? And why can't you go out for track this semester? And I'm like, because nothing, Mom. She's supportive, though. I have hinted that I'm making great connections. I know that you are connected globally to a large network that literally pulls all the strings of the world. <laughs> so I'm wondering if after this you could get me onto Broadway, <laughs> or at the very least, off Broadway. Without further ado, let's, let's um, get to the winner. So may I have the envelope, please? Winner the winner of the, of the 21st, 21st Thurber Prize, Prize for American, American Humor is James, James McBride. McBride. History is why James Thurber sat down the right. It's why Mark Twain sat down the right. It's why John, uh, Mike, and, and Alex sit down the right, because history counts. And so as much fun as we've had tonight, and as important as humor is, we have to find space to move the mountain a little bit beyond what we do. Um, so I'm asking you, I, I accept this award on behalf of myself and my two finalists um, and, uh, and John, um, with the knowledge, with, with the, the plea and the desire that you pay attention. That when you pick up the Washington Post, when you read Alex's work, what she's really saying is to pay attention and to, in your own little world, wherever it is, to sit down and after you write the check to the third organization, <laughs> write a check to, to the people who are really doing the work, the 81-year-old lady from California who was doing the work, the Jewish senator from New York who was doing the work, the people who are doing the work because our silence is the complicity that will allow the dangerous people in this country to take over. The fight is just beginning. Vote, vote, vote. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you.